questions and uh, then get rolling with today's talk. And I know that there's going to be some more people coming in. Um, I'm trying to wait for, for folks to come in. Um, but welcome. I'm Sue Flocky from the Prevention Research Center for Health and Neighborhoods in Cleveland. I'd like to welcome you all to our seminar series. It's the second Wednesday of every month um, that we have uh, our presentations and talk to share with you. Um, if you didn't sign in, please do. There's sign-in sheets out there. You can sign in on your way out. Um, but this helps us know, one, who's attending, um, and then can also communicate with you for upcoming presentations. Um, but we do like to know who's coming, and even if you've been here before, go ahead and sign in um, so you can track who's coming. Um, it also helps us plan for lunch. And a big thank you to Kathy, who makes terrific choices and um, assisting with um, making lunch arrangements. Um, I am going to give a very, very brief introduction and then have Darcy Friedman um, introduce our guest speaker today. Um, a, a new thing has come up. Um, so somebody has suggested that we've got uh, postcards or announcements, and, and maybe we should uh, come up with a, a way to, to actually do this, but there's a potluck in the park that's coming up September 27th. There's postcards if you want to learn more that are on the sign-in table. Um, and I suppose as we're growing as a community here and, and new people are coming, um, it may be that there are announcements or things that we'd like to disseminate early on. And um, perhaps if you could just find me and, and we'll, we'll come up with a way to do that so we can spread the information. Um, so I am going to uh, have Darcy do our, our formal in, uh, introductions because Darcy is a a colleague and friend um, of our, our guest speaker, Kimberly Bess. Um, so I've invited her to do our presentation today. All right. Well, good afternoon, I guess. Um, it's really exciting to see such a big group here today. And I think that the topic of social network analysis is largely you know, one of the major draws for bringing so many people here. Although, if people knew Kimberly better, they would also probably think Kimberly would be the major draw. But I know that... <laughs> Um, I just want to put a plug in to say there's a group of us at CASE and actually representing a couple of universities and organizations in the Cleveland area that are coming together around the methodology of social network analysis. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, let me know. Also, we have scheduled for May of 2015 another expert in the field of social network analysis, uh, Thomas Valente from California, will be giving a workshop a public lecture, and possibly even a, a science cafe style presentation um, come May of 2015. So keep your ears uh, open for that. So it is a great honor to have Dr. Kimberly Bess visiting us here today. Dr. Bess is on faculty in the Department of Human and Organizational Development at Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Bess describes her research as focused on investigating the ways that Community-based organizations serve as agents of social change. She has developed, this research has developed along two principal lines of inquiry. Uh, the first focuses on the internal din dynamics and organizational practices within each CBO, while the other examines the strategies pursued by community-based organizations as they seek to improve conditions with their, within their communities. One of the key characteristics of Dr. Bess's research is a focus not just on research for the sake of research, but really for inspiring action and change in the community. And that change is happening at multiple levels, which I think you'll hear today. I think a, a testament to her commitment to community uh, service and community change. In 2012, Dr. Bess was awarded the Harold Love Award for Outstanding Public Service by the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. I'm personally honored to have Kimberly here. We are actually both graduates of the same doctoral program and have done some collaboration around social network analysis. And Dr. Bess is going to be a consultant on the new core research, the Freshlink study, uh, that is the, the cornerstone research of our Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods. So without further ado, uh, welcome Dr. Bess. Thank you. Thank you, Darcy, for this very nice introduction. And thank you, Sue, uh, for having me and for all of you who are spending your lunchtime uh, with us today. Um, just to get a feel for the audience a little bit, how many of you have used social network analysis in your research? 
Okay, so some of you are not newbies. Um, how many of you want to use social network analysis or are considering it? Okay, okay. So a fair number of you. So today, um, what I'd like to do is to invite you to jump in, ask questions in uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes, if I go a little bit long. Um, there's only so much I can cover. So if you guys have interests or questions as I'm working through my presentation, feel free uh, to jump in and ask. I'd be happy to elaborate on the details of, of um, what I'm talking about. So uh, my journey into social and network analysis began uh, late in my own graduate career in about 2006. Um, I was thinking about um, really the problem of how do you build healthy communities. And um, at that point, I really began to realize that a lot of my questions had to do with uh, the social dynamics and social relations of complex systems. And I needed a way um, to examine that in a way that could capture those systems in a better way. I um, had much of my research up to that point was qualitative, and I was looking at organizations. Um, so I decided that I would take the leap, and I... Uh, went up to um, Michigan for one week training with Stan Wasserman. For those of you who have done some social network analysis may know his infamous textbook that is very good uh, to start off with. And took my uh, one week course and I've really been a student of social network analysis ever since and have used it in various ways um, in my research. So uh, what I hope to do today is to um, share some of that learning with you and talk about some of the projects that I'm working on. So when I, we think about social networks, um, we know that social networks are not new. Uh, our relationships and connections with other people um, matter, and we know that they've mattered for a long time. What perhaps is new is that in the last two decades, um, two things have really changed that have transformed our relationship uh, with um, social networks. Um, first, uh, we know that social media and uh, social networking sites like Facebook and LinkedIn have raised our awareness of the importance of social networks. We are reminded in our daily lives of the fabric, the social fabric uh, that we live in. And when we think about um, uh, health in particular, um, the media has really latched onto this. And I don't know how many of you have followed the work of um, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler and their colleagues, um, but they have really popularized the idea of social networks and health um, in some of their studies uh, using the Framington uh, Heart Study um, data. So when we in our social consciousness, when we start thinking about, well, what is this thing about social networks and how does it affect our behavior and our health, um, we have the example of social contagion. So this first uh, little slide, um, if you can see, is this working? I might have to get out here a little bit more. No? Well, anyway, uh, does that work? Nobody can see it. Okay, well, in increased risk of becoming uh, obese when a person is in his social network becomes obese. If you have a mutual friend, your risk goes up 171%. And we have this uh, Homer Simpson uh, slide that, or cartoon that says, do your fr uh, friends make you fat? So there's an awareness of how our health is affected by our networks. Uh, loneliness. Um, they've also looked at loneliness. And uh, so the New York Times headline was why loneliness can make you, uh, can be contagious. Um, one of the saddest uh, things that I found was uh, no longer lonely. He lost 225 pounds. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that um, our weight and our social well-being might be interconnected um, is fairly troubling, but we need to understand that a little bit more. And then finally, social networks can be very helpful to us. Uh, friends quit smoking, uh, you probably will too. And so it's this idea that um, networks influence behavior and uh, that we can learn a lot um, uh, from studying them. So my agenda uh, for today is to explore some foundational ideas um, 
of the network perspective through, through two very different projects. Uh, one project, the Tied Together Social Support Network project, um, is a project that looks at personal networks or ego networks. Uh, the other project that I'm going to talk about is some work that I did around youth violence prevention, a youth violence prevention uh, network um, that was part of a five-year longitudinal study. Um, in particular, I hope to highlight some of the ways that social network analysis can help us better understand a set of interconnected challenges, um, often re referred to as wicked problems, uh, that particularly affect those living in high poverty communities and those who are trying to intervene uh, in those problems as well. So I'm going to start off with um, talking just briefly about a central concept in social network analysis, which is the idea of social embeddedness. We have all forever really understood uh, through the social determinants of health and eco ecological theory that societal norms and values influence uh, the way that we behave, the way that we act. What the social network perspective really brings is the idea that it's not only sort of these general things, it's values and norms, but the particular relationships of the relational systems in which we're embedded. So this might be individuals that are embedded in family systems and those networks. It could be the neighborhood or relational community, so how your friends affect you or influence you and the local institutions that you're connected to. And so when we think about uh, social systems and networks, we want to think about all of those ecological levels and really think about uh, their interdependencies. Um, sociologist uh, Mark Granovetter um, really captured this idea in a very succinct way. He said, actors do not behave or decide as atoms outside a social context nor do they adhere slavishly to a script written for them by the particular intersection of social categories that they happen to occupy. Their attempts at purposive action are instead embedded in concrete ongoing systems of social relations. So this idea that we are embedded in contexts that our choices may be constrained or our opportunities enhanced by those to whom we relate um, is a fundamental idea of social network analysis. Um, this uh, never became more clear to me. I was working on a study with um, Dr. Uh, uh, Sabina Gazelle and Dr. Sherry Barkin at Vanderbilt University. Um, they're in the pediatrics department and they contacted me and said, would you um, be willing to help us out? We're doing this study on obesity prevention and we want to do a social network analysis. So I said, sure. And so uh, we, I talked to them, and I, we figured out how they were going to collect their data. They did a roster, um, and they did a list of people in the control group and the experimental group, and they had everybody in their intervention basically say, I know this person, this is a person I'm related to, this is a friend. And so we got some data about the social networks. And uh, uh, I think I can do this. Anybody see it? It was there. Yeah, it was there. Well, anyway, maybe if I go out in front. No. So as you can see, in the control group and the intervention group, uh, they were randomly assigned to those groups, and it looks pretty good. There are a few connections among them in the pretest, And so the, the dots represent individuals, and the lines represent connections between those individuals. So we have the blue control, the red intervention. In the post-test, we see that both the control and the intervention groups, their connections with one another increased. So you think about that, and you think, ah, that's kind of strange, a little bit strange that the control groups should have so many um, connections. Um, and, but it was statistically significant, the difference, so we went along. But what they had done, instead of just asking the control group about the control group and the intervention group about the intervention group, they had asked everybody to talk about everybody else. So you can see here that there, the control and intervention groups were not independent at all. In fact, they were already embedded in a relational community. And 
in the post-test, you can really see how those relationships develop. So from a perspective of sort of um, traditional research, you'd say, oh my god, you know, this is terrible. We don't really know what's affecting the outcome here because everybody was already related. But from a social network perspective, when we start to think about, you know, how can we use this these connections to leverage interventions because we don't really know but we assume that obviously some of the intervention was reaching the control group um, through the network. So some central concepts that I'm going to talk about um, today. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask a question sure. on the prior slide? Yeah. Uh, what was the nature of the connection? Is it just, I know somebody, or I'm influenced by somebody, or... Anything? Yes, so for, for this one, it, it was an aggregate, just if they actually knew the other person. Um, so there, if they were acquainted or knew them, it could have been that they were a friend or a family member, but mostly uh, just acquainted. So it was aggregated from all the different possible responses. Yeah. Other questions? So I'm going to talk about four central concepts today that have to do with how you think about and measure um, social networks. The first has to do with cohesion or density. We're often really interested in how networks grow and develop and change. And uh, so you can imagine that um, the first one where the dots are disconnected, obviously that is, we can hardly call that a network because nobody's uh, connected. But imagine you're um, teaching a class of first year students at a university and they all get to your class and they don't know each other. Um, the first day they don't know each other. But you want to study over time what happens to them and how those networks form and uh, the relationships develop. So. Uh, toward the end, you would know that it would be a complete uh, network and it everybody would be connected. So we're interested in how density changes. Density has a lot to do with the flow of information, uh, people's sense of community. So more connected networks um, uh, offer those kinds of benefits. Um, the second concept is the concept of hierarchy or centralization. Um, in more centralized networks, if you think about networks um, as like an organizational network, the typical org chart and everyone is reporting to everybody else and it's very hierarchical. We think of those kinds of structures as being uh, more efficient um, and more effective in that way. So when we think about the perfect um, hierarchical network, it's the star network. And imagine for just a second that if you were looking down at the ground and you just pull that middle dot up, you're going to get the star network is going to turn into something that looks more like what we think of as a hierarchy. Uh, the third concept that we often study in social networks is this idea of multiplexity. And uh, this gentleman over here uh, asked that question, what was the relation? So it's the idea that we are related in multiple ways to people. Um, for example, I might be uh, yellow and I might work with uh, blue and red. Um, I might, uh, my kids might go to school with green um, and uh, I might share information with red, something like that. So our position in a network depends on the relationship. Uh, that we're studying, and those can be very important. So, for example, in you know one relationship, um, when we think about hierarchy, for instance, I might be in the middle, which would give me a lot more power, right, at mediating the relationship between uh, other people in that network. Um, but in another network, I might be in a more peripheral uh, position. And finally, there's this um, idea of homophily. Um, it's the idea of birds of a feather flock together. And it really is around the question of how do form, uh, ties form? So what is driving tie formation? And we know that people uh, like to be connected with people who are like them. So it's um, connection based on similarity. And so we were talking this morning a little bit about interorganizational networks and how um, it's important to get diverse actors in networks together because they offer different kinds of perspectives and different kinds of resources. And so sometimes we're going to want, we're not going to want to see homophily, 
Other times, homophily is really good. It offers a more social cohesion. It offers individuals a sense of belonging. So uh, we'd be more interested in that. Last question. Sure. It seems like there's two dimensions to the cohesion density. One is whether the tie exists or not. Mm-hmm. But then when you talked about sense of community, another is how strong the nature of that yes. tie, how meaningful is it to you. It seems like two different things to pack in one. That's right. Concept. Yes. Are they both? Is that right? That both? Yeah. So um, it depends on what the network is. So you could have a, you know, a very cohesive network of um, at a work organization just because they're reporting ties of the way it's structured. But that you're absolutely right. That doesn't mean I feel closer to you, or I feel a strong sense of community to you. So it depends. Absolutely depends on the network relation. Yeah. So the first project that I'm going to talk a little bit about is um, a project that I worked on uh, for about two years with an organization. Uh, they had been uh, really thinking about how to integrate their services from cradle uh, to career. They had been interested in what was happening at the Harlem Children's Zone. And so we went up together and uh, went to the Practitioners Institute up there and learned about their programs. And they came back to Nashville and decided they were going to do um, their version of baby college. And they called it Tied Together. Um, it was a 10-week uh, place-based education program. It targeted uh, families with children 0 to 4. It was very intergenerational. We had uh, grandmothers there. We had siblings there. Um, so it was a, a pretty diverse group of individuals. Um, and it targeted low-income families and pretty much families that were uh, living in high poverty, uh, a high poverty public housing neighborhood uh, and the surrounding community. Um, and of course, I just said it was modeled after the Harlem Children's Zone. So if you can see where that star is and that uh, kind of square area, that is the public housing and where the community uh, organization is located. It's absolutely embedded within uh, this uh, public housing. Um, just over to your left, there's LP Field where the Tennessee Titans plays, play, and then right across uh, the river is downtown Nashville. So the location of this community organization and this public housing is really adjacent to downtown Nashville, but it's extremely isolated still. People in that community um, are not really accessing the resources of that downtown area, and so this intervention was to really uh, to help um, the, those community members, those parents, uh, c become connected with resources. So who were the participants in this study? Uh, they were mostly single, female, African American. Most resided in the public housing, although some of them lived in the surrounding area. Most were unemployed, um, very few in school. And about 29% of these um, participants had reported previous poor birth outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that's really high considering um, that I don't, anybody here like an expert in this? It seems very high to me. I think the, the rate is much, on average, uh, nationally much lower. Um, but the state of Tennessee is third in infant mortality and fifth <coughs> in preterm labor and low birth weight. So this is really a problem. And so part of the impetus for this program was really to start dealing with um, teens having children and the problems around um, parenting that we were seeing in this community. So the program aims, uh, one of the biggest things was making new connections. It was a place-based program, really feeling that they wanted to work with families to get them connected to people in their neighborhood, but also to new resources, uh, to empowering parents through knowledge. And so there was a host of uh, every week when the families would meet, uh, there would be a different topic ranging from brain development, ages and stages, health, nutrition, safety, um, and discipline. They called it loving guidance. They didn't want to call it discipline. Um, and then more broadly, they were really focused on building a caring uh, community um, where people could develop a culture of respect and trust. Um, and it was a very inclusive setting, um, including really anybody who was part of the child's life. They would welcome them into the program. And there was a, 
a, a lot of time spent for uh, sharing, um, uh, also valuing small wins when parents would come in and they'd have something to talk about, uh, about something that had happened to them. Uh, they would share that. And then they did some home visits. Um, so um, this is pretty consistent. When we think of the role of community centers in uh, the, the lives and the, uh, the health outcomes of low-income families, uh, Mario Small, I don't know if any of you know his work, he's a sociologist, um, he, his, he found that enrolling a child in a child care center statistically associated, is statistically associated with lower material and mental hardship on the mother um, and that much of this is tied to the friendships made in these centers. So we know that community organizations play a vital role in getting parents connected, and this has uh, an influence on their health. So today I'm primarily going to focus on um, this making uh, connections part and talk about some of the networks. So um, thinking again about personal networks, and uh, what are some of the sources that influence it. When we think about who are in our personal networks, we think of a host of different kinds of sources for those personal networks, including you know, our neighbors, our family members, people maybe in our faith communities, um, in our educational settings or work settings, um, and, and the various groups that we belong to. But in high poverty neighborhoods, what we know is that people are very disconnected institutionally from those other spaces. Their life spaces are fairly anemic. Um, and that in this community in particular, people are relying on their families and relying on relationships or having relationships with people in their neighborhoods. Not necessarily because they want to, but because they don't really uh, have opportunities to go beyond and outside their own uh, neighborhoods. They don't have transportation frequently, and so they're, they're fairly stuck uh, in the neighborhood. So uh, tie, the Tied Together program, when we think of uh, what the goal was, it was to expand connections through a, this place-based parent education program, and that the Tied Together program provided this alternative setting uh, for developing healthy connections and enhancing people's social support. So for the research, um, we were really interested in, in uh, a couple of things. We assumed that people through this program were going to enhance their connections. So we wanted to know, do uh, participants' networks increase in size? We wanted to know who was in those networks. Who did they bring in? Who was out? Um, we wanted to also to know if there were discernible patterns in the structure um, of those networks. And uh, we wanted to know if those changed over time. And we also wanted to um, really dig in and, and ask the question, well, how are people making sense of their networks? What are they thinking about them? So it gets to this question of, of meaning. You know, who's close and who's not so close? And this is actually a picture of uh, the first... Uh, graduating class from the program. Yes? Are, are you talking about single moms or, 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 or families? Uh, or you, you, you equalize both? So we're talking about mainly single moms. And the, the sample included some men, um, but the, most of the participants were women. Um, some of the participants were caregivers, so they might have been the grandparents uh, because the parents weren't, um, did not have custody of the children. Um, some of them were aunts and uncles that had temporary uh, caregiving responsibilities. So it was a wide variety. It wasn't well controlled. When you think about a study and you want to have your population, but this was their philosophy was really to bring in anybody who was part of the, the child's life. Um, that would uh, affect their um, well-being. Yeah. So um, the method that we used for this particular study, it was a mixed method, uh, case study design, and we uh, collected social network data through um, a convoy uh, mapping process that I'm going to talk about in just a second. And we uh, then entered all those data into a UCI net, which is the program that we use to analyze the data. We also did um, post uh, 
interviews with uh, graduates of the program, and we used LSTI to um, do some thematic um, analysis. And these, this is a picture of just one group that had um, worked on their own maps, and I'm going to, there's another, a better picture um, here of one of the maps. Okay, so this is how we collected data. We were really interested in multiplexity about sort of the the um, complexity of uh, participants' networks and, and really looking in depth about how those changed. So we first asked participants um, to identify people who are important to them in their lives um, around parenting and around um, uh, giving them social support. So we asked them um, to uh, identify family with a red sticker, a friend with a blue sticker, and other uh, with a yellow sticker. And you can't quite um, see it on here. Uh, and they, they filled it, we filled out a form and they listed all those various people. And, I'm try and they put initials on each of the um, stickers. Um, then we then asked them to place, this is sort of the convoy map, they're in the middle, and we asked them to place the dots on there relative to how close they were um, to them. So closest obviously being uh, in the center and not as close being in the periphery. We then asked them to think about the kinds of the support they got from those people in their network. So we asked them about information support, and then we asked them to put a line from themselves to anyone in their network um, who gave them information support, provided them with information about um, child care or about the schools or anything that they needed that pertained to their child. We then asked them to think about those individuals who provided help to them or assistance in their parenting. And that could be anything from you know, somebody who would give them a ride to the doctor's office or would watch their kids for a little while while they went out um, grocery shopping, that kind of assistance. We then asked um, them to identify those individuals who provided emotional support to them. We also asked them, um, so they would create those connections. We also then asked them to think about all those people in the network and to make a connection between um, anyone in the network who was connected to each other. This allowed us to, when we actually did the analysis of the data, to um, calculate the density of the networks. So we also wanted to know whether these networks were, um, you know, if people were connecting with people who weren't connected, or was everybody connected? And that, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. We asked them to put a star around people who uh, they gave support to, so this idea of reciprocity, which is important in networks. And then we asked them to put a circle around those folks in their networks who were a source of negative support. So they might be providing emotional support on the one hand, but really causing them problems on the other hand. Um, and then we had some altered characteristics that we were interested in. Um, one of them was neighbors. So who in your uh, network is a neighbor? So those people might be able to provide additional support. And then we also wanted to know who was a tied together graduate. So who was a graduate of the program? And that was important to see if these networks, as they changed, if people were bringing in uh, people from the program into their networks. Alter, yes. Alter is, so the ego is you, and the alter are those other folks in the network. And the close, closer, closest, is that emotional closeness or also like intensity, how close in terms of intensity of the relationship? So we did not define that for them, but I think the assumption is how emotionally close they are. You know, if you're a close friend or a close family member. Oh, and one interesting thing about this network. So this was somebody's network, and you can't really see it on the corner. A lot of the moms wanted to put their kids in the middle, like on top of them in their network. And so we decided, you know, okay, kids shouldn't be the source of support for their parents. So we put them, we said, there's a special spot for your kids. Put your kids, you can have your kids, but put them over in the corner. Um, so we had them uh, do that. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you can see with this network, there's some negative support going on there. Um, and primarily, people who are close in. 
I don't see any assistance of support in this network. Um, and you can see that there's somebody in their network who's not even connected, doesn't even provide support when they thought about it. So, and it's a pretty small network. If we think about it, yeah. A uh, question. Um, these are the individuals in that housing network. Was there a community service center in that network, or, did, or is that something that was overlooked or they didn't, thought, didn't think it was necessary? So these are um, individual participants in the in the program, and so there they there are staff members who are part of this program, and they will show up on some of the networks. So they are some of the folks really developed close relationships with the staff and decided to include them. So is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what did we learn? Well, it was far, yeah. Sorry, I just want to sure. revisit the statement you made about moving the child out of the center. Yeah. Um, and I know this is about connections with other people. I'm just thinking back to a researcher, physician, David Hilfiger, who talked about, especially younger parents, wanting to have kids to get meaning in life and so on and so forth. Yeah. And if it was about meaning as well, and you told them to move the kid out, I'm, I'm wondering just what happened, you know, yeah. the implications that happened. Yeah, so we acknowledged, we said, of course your kids are at the center and the most important people in your lives. Um, but I guess the what we were thinking about more was, you know, the idea that, and there's been some research done on this, that Oftentimes, some moms who are very isolated really rely heavily on their children to provide support and perhaps sometimes inappropriately. And so we wanted them to consider their networks um, in a way that didn't disconnect them from their kids. That This is a special place for your kids. That's what we told them. But we wanted them to look at their network and be able to perceive it. One of the reasons why we use this methodology was because, number one, it was low tech and that it was very visual, but that the, the participants could actually reflect on their network and see their network and have some agency in deciding what, you know, whether they liked their network or whether they were getting the kind of support that they wanted. Yeah. So how long would it take for someone to fill this out? This took about 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. About that long. So it, it was much more complicated um, than we thought. You always go into these things thinking, yeah, of course their networks will expand and increase. But what we found was that uh, actually the size of their networks decreased uh, from pre to post. Now, um, this was a very small sample size. We, we had a lot of data. Um, but when it came to having data from that we actually had a pretest and a post test of the network maps and had um, were able to get them to do the interview, uh, it was like 28 cases. So it's really a small sample size. Um, but we did find that on average, these networks were small to begin with, only about you know nine. Um, they on average they were about 7.5 in the post test. Um, and when we take what we call the effective average size, which is taking out those redundant um, ties, so ties to um, where people like, you know, Joe over here and Joe is connected to these resources and Anne's over here and Anne's connected to these resources. So those they're connected to different networks. Then it goes way down to uh, a little over um, four. We also could see that these were fairly dense networks, which is in small networks you would expect that. Um, but a lot of them, you can see at the very top, they're really verging on everybody knowing everybody in the network. So in one way that you would say, well, that's people have a strong sense of connection. In another way, they're really not connecting to a lot of outside um, resources. So, um, and when we start to look at the network, characteristics of the network, um, we start to get a broader picture. So, for example, um, in um, the percentage of participants who included family members in their network, um, this just shows mothers and fathers and uh, spouse or partner, but that also decreased. And 
really a little over 50% might include their own mothers. So when we consider the population, maybe this is not very surprising, but a lot of times those um, supports were, were absent in the networks. Um, and even, I think, probably to me a little bit more surprising was they were parents and, you know, spouses and partners were not always um, in the picture. And so they really were looking for sources of support. So in the post-test, we found that um, there might have been some replacement going on. So the mothers and fathers, may, they may have decided, you know, maybe they shouldn't be in my network, but I'm really getting a lot of support from other tied together grads or the staff of the um, center where the program was held. Um, we also found that the number of alters providing support, specific types of support um, really decreased except for information support. Yeah? Did the people reconsider support in the post-test? Like they, they've gotten support in the intervention that they've never gotten before and then they kind of slide the scale when they take the post? I do. <clears throat> yeah, I do think that was some of it. I don't think that was for all the participants, but I think the process of thinking about the support became an intervention uh, for some folks, and that they started to think about, well, who is in this network? Who does support me? And the program became, a lot of people talked about the program like becoming a family. And so they had their family that was part of the program, and they were providing maybe more support sometimes than their actual uh, blood relatives. Yeah. Does yeah. online support include like Facebook or other Yeah, so we didn't we didn't talk we didn't ask about online support and and part of it because a, a lot of people did not have access to online stuff. Although a lot of them were on Facebook and probably today um, with sort of the, the this community now is a connected community. Um, and so there's internet access for folks um, living in this community. And there's, so they're working on building connections. So a lot of people now have um, Facebook and so on. But a lot of them, the, they have phones that, you know, for those of you who work in high poverty communities know that they might have a phone for, um, you know, two weeks and then the phone goes off and you're trying to reach them. And so that kind of, um, intermittent connection becomes challenging. So you might have a friend this week, but she might move away, and then how do you connect with her when your phone goes dead? And So it's, it's a challenge for some of these folks, but online probably is the best source for them, the best source of keeping those connections alive through things like Facebook. Um, so we decided to dig in a little bit more. It, the... Uh, you know, we were seeing some patterns and we were thinking, we know that um, people are making connections. So we looked at the qualitative data and we came up with basically four different patterns that we were seeing. So Lawrence represents um, the first pattern and we call this maintaining the, an isolationist stance. These were people who came into the program and then his network was actually fairly large to begin with. Um, and it decreases somewhat, but it doesn't change. He was not there necessarily to make connections. He was sort of buffering himself against um, uh, people in the community. And so this is a quote, I generally stay to myself. I don't go to people's houses. I'm not trying to be mean, but most parents, they don't know how to raise their own kids because they uh, wasn't raised right. So it these are people who um, came for the information, they were really focused on that, but they weren't focused on making connections, and in fact, they didn't want to. They, they felt those connections were kind of risky. Um, Deneen, we call this group testing the water, and there were a lot of folks who came to the program who were surprised by the fact that they were making those connections, and so they were tentatively um, connecting with others, but their networks didn't uh, change all that much. And you can see that there's a little bit of switching out, I think, in this network. There's a church member that comes in and maybe a tied together um, staff member or participant is in this network. But by and large, this network didn't change. Um, she um, increased her um, the percent of alters who provided support, but um, really her network didn't grow that much. 
And what she said was, I learned to meet a whole lot of peoples that I didn't know. And I learned to meet them on the outside. Speak with them. Speak to them with respect. You know, even if I just said, good morning, hi, or something, we still all right. And the peoples they had in there, it might have been if we was off the hinges. But before the program was over, we all joined together and we was like one big family. That's the way we see it one big family. So you get the sense that people are making those connections, but they're, they're testing it out. They, they're not ready to sort of commit. And it was a 10-week program, so maybe it was a, a lot of expectation to see uh, that they would bring them into their networks. Um, the third category that we um, uh, came up with was this idea of changing the game. These were people who really decided I've got to change my life. I've got to have to get a new set of relations, and their networks changed uh, quite a bit. So Turia is a great example of this. You see in her network, it's, hi it's highly dense. Um, everybody knows everybody else in that network. Um, but what she says about her network, that little thing we did, and points to the network map, uh, I had so many dots as far as friends, but now it's like I realized that I cut my circle off. Like I realized some of my friends are just coming around and we really weren't doing anything productive. We really weren't doing anything. So I had to cut my circle of friends down. And even though the circle is smaller, I have more support. And so this idea of really being an agent in their own destiny really came through uh, with um, what was happening with Turia. And you can see, which is kind of interesting, Turia moves from the outside of her network in the pretest to more of the center. And now she has, um, she's kind of the bridge between her family and her new tied together uh, family. And finally, we have Randy. And Randy sort of was an outlier. There are very few Randys, um, but really represented those people who the networks just really blossomed and changed. Um, and you can see from the pre to the post test, Randy has included lots of folks uh, from, the tied to, from the Tied Together program, from the Tied Together staff, and he's really reduced the number of people um, that were friends or family members. Um, so Randy said, everybody just came like part of my family after a while. It's hard for me to trust people. I got a lot of bad trust issues, but once I got here and got to know people, you know, it's really trustworthy. It benefited me in meeting some wonderful people and friends and stuff at, and the Martha O'Brien Center is always going to be here for me. It makes me feel comfortable to know that if I ever need anything uh, or need something done, I can come here and count on these, you know, count on these people here to take care of that for me. So that was a really transformational life experience for Randy um, in coming to the program. It raises a whole host of issues of really what is the role of the community organization, but for him, his network changed. So um, just to sum up kind of some uh, initial learnings from this project, uh, connections are risky. Um, I'll exclude myself from outsiders because I don't really like the neighborhood. It's not the neighborhood, it's the people that make the neighborhood bad. Um, so this idea that it's going to take a little bit more to get people to start connecting and owning those uh, connections and relationships. Um, beyond social isolation, the role of strong and weak ties. We saw in these networks that they were primarily family networks, and they were just beginning to um, connect with what we might call weaker, weak connections, which would be staff members and, and um people that they were more like acquaintances rather than friends. Um, so we started to see that happening. Um, did they connect to some of those other resources? Uh, we did not see that. So even though lots of people came through the program and they were really connected with a lot of different other kinds of resources, they weren't talking about that in, they weren't talking about those connections in the interviews or in their networks. So that is a weakness of, of, of the outcome. Um, testing the waters, uh, this was kind of a finding. These are acquaintances that were being developed but not truly friends. 
at first I was in the house, didn't know nobody. Now I feel like I have friends. We can talk to each other uh, and chit chat about our kids and stuff. It got me out of the house, it got me to meet people, and it got my daughter to meet people. And then this idea of spreading uh, the word. This is great when you think about how do you diffuse and get people to come to a program like this. And so some of the participants, participants talked about how they wanted to spread the word about this program. Uh, this uh, woman mom says, I want to encourage them because it was spread to me and I want to spread it to somewhere else. So this idea that parenting and, and healthy parenting can be uh, contagious. Okay, so I'm going to switch now um, and talk about a completely different project. This was a, a five-year a longitudinal study of um, organizations working in youth violence prevention. And it was part of a larger CDC project um, in which uh, they funded three different research projects, uh, the one that I'm going to talk about, and a community coalition. And we, the project, is we refer to it as New Pace. Uh, because it was the National Urban Partnership for Academic Excellence. Um, so uh, some of the network questions, going back to those core concepts that we talked about um, around sort of collaboration, one of the things we got interested in um, when we started working on this was what's the relationship between this larger intervention network of organizations that are collaborating and the coalition, those group of organizations that were participating in the coalition, and how does the coalition influence um, this larger network? So uh, the question around density was, does the uh, rate of collaboration during uh, the period when the coalition is active, does that increase? Uh, the centralization or hierarchy question was, does the network structure become more hierarchical? Uh, centrality, we were interested to know whether organizations that were part of the coalition, did they increase their centrality and, and some might say power within the larger network um, during the period in which uh, the coalition was active? And finally, homophily, do organizations in the network prefer to collaborate with other organizations uh, that are similar? Um, so the overarching question that we had was really around how does coalition activity enhance the capacity of the intervention um, system? And yeah, time. Yeah. So we have three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Um, so this work was based uh, largely on uh, community capacity um, coalition community coalition action theory. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I want to get to the network stuff. But there's a large sort of theory that undergirds uh, this work. Um, so in thinking about the questions, um, so one of the ideas was that the intervention system really was uh, representing what we might call a serendipitous network in which it was a very decentralized network in which uh, relationships developed dyadically between organizations based on largely based on opportunity. So um, a lot of us, we know somebody in another organization, so we say, let's collaborate. I know Darcy, and so Darcy contacted me, so we're forming this collaboration. In a goal-directed network, which would be the coalition, um, it's a structured, hierarch uh, structured hierarchy established through a, ra a rational planning process. So those relationships are tightly coupled, they're goal-directed, there's uh, leadership, and that favors a more um, hom homogeneous um, type of network. So here is a picture of the network, um, and the white, node, or white squares are the coalition uh, participants, and the black are those who did not participate. So I am not going to talk about this, but I'm sure this will be uh, listed. So what do we find out um, for density? Um, so one of the things that we were interested in knowing is what happened to density. Our assumption, again, when we began is, of course, collaboration will increase. And indeed, it did. Um, so uh, from the baseline to year one, uh, we had an increase with a, a falling off. And actually, this is a pattern that has been established in the coalition literature. And we found that that extended um, to the coalition um, as a whole. And if you can see on the bottom chart, that uh, blue line is if we just took the coalition alone 
and looked at their interaction, you can see a big spike. Um, so during that formation period, we're seeing an increase in collaboration. And then as the activity um, becomes more implementation of the coalition um, goals, fewer people are collaborating, and then it kind of drops off. Um, this could be a little bit problematic when we think about, well, you know, what kind of sustainability do we have with a coalition's effort? But this kind of pattern actually is um, linked to greater capacity. Um, hierarchy, what did we find? Um, so this was some modeling. If anybody's interested, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. But it's a longitudinal modeling program that I use um, to model uh, this network. So I was looking at network hierarchy and uh, we found that indeed there was a tendency toward increased hierarchy in this network um, through in-degree and out-degree popularity. And uh, the centrality of coalition participants. So we wanted to know, you know, were coalition participants receiving more nominations from other folks in the network? And indeed they were. This is significant. That would be coalition alter. But the question of whether uh, coalition participants were more active, were they increasing their what we call out degree ties, um, that was non-significant. And so that was interesting and it really uh, reinforces this idea that the network was becoming more hierarchical. And this was confirmed in cross-sectional analyses as well. We see um, this low, the gray line is the network centralization as a whole and the red is uh, the coalition centralization only. And then finally, uh, homophily. Uh, we looked at homophily in this model, and there was no significant homophily in either relating to the same organizational type or um, in coalition participation. So did coalition participants as a group and non-coalition participants uh, prefer to have ties with each other. That was non-significant, but when we did the breakdown, we found a significant, you can see with the coalition participants collaborating with each other, that uh, was significant. Um, and we looked at within and between group ties, and you can see that the lines are just on top of each other. So there really was um, overall no preference. So, um, I think I'll just stop here. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And We've got about 10 minutes or so for questions me. and discussion. Just a question. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things, I, years ago I worked in, in uh, New York City. I worked, I used to work with street gangs. Uh, all it shows basically, uh, uh, once you start working with a group of people, they have an interest. If you, but if you keep doing the same thing year after year or month after month, their interest is going to wane. Uh, and I found that when I brought in other gang members into the, to my particular group, the interest peaked because now it's a case of boys being boys. I want to show you what I've learned. Uh, and, I, and I think all, all your programs will do the same thing if you don't bring another outside entity into to stimulate the, uh, the participants of your program. And so many programs is basically that I've seen through my years is this is my program and I don't care what anybody else thinks and, and all interest will always wane. Is there, any, is there any type of way to bring in similar programs to your particular program to keep that, that interest there? Or they never, or did they ever think about that? Yeah, that great point. Like one of the things that uh, the Tied Together program did was every week they brought in folks from the outside. So they were always bringing in new people into the community. And this was kind of... Um, against, in a way, our, our training, bringing experts in to tell the community, you know, what to do. But what we found was that the community members felt extremely valued uh, by the presence of folks that were coming from the library or from 
um, the Department of uh, Children and Services coming to talk to them or mm -hmm. pediatricians, they felt very valued. So part of the program was to connect people to outside resources, but by, by really bringing them into the community. And it had the effect also for those people who were um, presenters, they came away with a really different impression of the community. Uh, because oftentimes they were dealing with community members in situations in which uh, there there was an issue or a problem. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing the two projects. I found it interesting that both of these projects were examining change in networks, and I hadn't really thought about it. And I'm very very new to this. Um, I hadn't really thought about it in that way. And is that a typical application of social network analysis? Is that you're actually looking for interventions that are changing networks? And can you were there other outcomes examined, or is that could you just talk a little bit about outcomes and, and change in network as an outcome? Yeah, so I'm really interested in change, and so that's why I was really focused on that. But absolutely, um, a lot of network studies are looking at you know, particular interventions and the outcome on particular, for example, health behaviors. So um, in the Siena modeling um, that we do, two things you can examine. One is, you know, what is the, what's driving selection? So are people selecting other um, people or organizations selecting other organizations based on um, things like homophily or based on network position. Um, so that's one question that you can answer. But the other question you can a a answer is, you know, how is the network actually affecting behavior? So, um, for example, there's been a lot of work looking at um, adolescence and things like smoking behavior or drinking behavior. Um, so they look at sort of um, people's position in the network and how that might influence um, those kinds of outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. So I like the results from the first study where you presented the qualitative along with the network results. I wonder if you can comment on how you use or can use qualitative data in these types of studies to interpret changes in the network. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that I learned, and um, I have a, a doctoral student who's, who's uh, using this methodology in schools and, and in, with um, students who are in the process of um, going to college. And so they're looking at their support networks in terms of going to college. And we did ask people and we probed them about their networks, but I think you could, we could have been even more systematic about that. Um, people had a lot of comments and a lot of thoughts about what those networks meant to them. And so I think that you, you know, you absolutely, is that what, kind of what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. So I think you can be very systematic about, tell me about your network. And there have been a lot of studies, um, not a lot, but there have been some studies that look at um, lifespan trajectories. Um, and for example, in parenting, and they've gone and they've followed people over decades um, and looked at as people go through you know, the stages of life and, and had them talk about their networks and looked at how their networks were changing in terms of the kinds of people that they're, they're connected to and what those relationships mean. And that's a very qualitative way of doing network analysis. They're probably not even doing, you know, putting them into a program and looking at things like density and some other things that you can look at. Yeah, so there are folks who do really qualitative network analysis. Yeah. Yes? Hi. I was wondering how if, uh, this question between homophily and diversity, the absence of homophily, can, can you assume that that's purpose of diversity, or is it like accidental diversity? Or um, in this case, I would say it's kind of accidental, but it's kind of what we would expect to see. So I we would hope that we would not have homophily in a, in a youth violence prevention network because we want organizations to work uh, together and to bring together diverse resources to address the problem. So there's always kind of this balance. People say, well, too much homophily is not good because people become insular. Too much homophily, it becomes really hard for people to work together because they're really coming from perspectives that are so different that they, it, they have a hard time getting to action. And so when you think about homophily, this doesn't really do a good job showing it, but you, you kind of want to know, well, you know, are you somewhere 
in between. You want enough diversity in your network. And we only looked at homophily with respect to organizational type and coalition um, activity. But you can look at other things like values. For example, in one study they were talking about a prevention network that um, used uh, that where people had collaborated a lot beforehand. And I think actually Tom Valente is on this paper. But they um, had really done a lot of CBPR together. And so it was the it was very values driven. Um, and so people, that really influenced the way that people work together. So those networks, for example, were probably more homophilous and a little bit denser, um, but less centralized. Um, so these three ideas kind of can work in concert with each other. Normally you would find if it's a very dense network, it's, it's going to be more homophilous. Yeah. Yes. Um, when people were doing the, you know, when you were looking at the pre and the post with people's network and their perception of their network, um, I thought it was interesting where people were dropping out. Um, they were considering people who used to be in their network and no longer in their network. And how were they, were they instructed in any way about how to interpret who is in their network and who is not? Is it like, you know, I don't speak to that person anymore or I just mentally made a shift in whether or not I find their um, existence in my life supportive yeah. or not Well, so we uh, we use the same protocol in the pre and the post. So we didn't uh, we didn't bring back their um, pre networks to, to show them, but that would have been really interesting. It would have been very interesting to have them actually comment on what about the changes that they made. We could have done that uh, in hindsight. That would have been brilliant, but uh, the. But when we looked at it, because we expected them to, to actually change, um, but it would have been great to have them do the network the second time and then comment on some of the changes that they made. Um, you know, another thing is there's, of course, always questions of kind of reliability. On this day, I feel like, wow, this person I'm really close with, but, you know, this week we got in a fight, so I'm not putting them in my network. Um, so even though we think of networks as stable and enduring over time, I think that this, there might be some of an artifact there around just, you know, it's the day. Um, so we need to do a lot more work. To, to kind of unravel that. One final question. I have a question about communicating your findings. Mm -hmm. And if you've got an audience, so this is really helpful for this particular audience perhaps. You've got an audience who just wants to kind of boil it down and yeah. is looking for, give me one indicator, give me one number, give me one. One of the challenges yeah. of using this is it's very complex and it helps when you can drill down and you can talk about certain yeah. stories. Your right. experience in terms of the audience that needs to yeah. boil it down? Well, in the Youth Violence Prevention Network, we worked really hard to communicate our findings to, to really to the coalition and to people who were part of this project. And that was really diff difficult. Um, I think we, I remember in the, one of the first um, years we brought back and we were talking about, we had maps that showed um, where different types of organizations were located in the network. So the human service organizations, the law enforcement organizations, the immigrant organizations, and so on and so forth. And what we found was, you know, it was very, very hard for people to interpret the information. So I think it, it's absolutely um, a challenge. People with the ego networks, they respond much better to those because that's part of, you know, there's a story and that's part of who they are. But for these complex networks, um, I think it's it's a lot more difficult. And people probably, I mean, graphs are actually probably a little bit better um, for them. Um, but the other problem we had was um, because of confidentiality issues and because here you are in a network and the organizations answer all these questions, but if if you're an organization and you're on the outside of the network, um, that could be devastating to you. So, you know, publicly sharing actually positions in the network can be difficult. Um, now, when Darcy and I did some work together, um, you fed back all the network data to the community food security partners. And I think that was probably a little bit more actionable. 
Um, but again, I think it was difficult because in that study, like the farms um, were really kind of way on the outside and there was really a dominant core of the what we would call the um, usual suspects in the middle, the power brokers. And, you know, really what the goal was, it was to create a network <coughs> where the, you know, the people who were central to the system, the um, community organizations and the farmers were more central in the network. And, you know, that's, that's a difficult thing to change. But I think this is something where um, there's a lot to be learned about. How do, you, how do you communicate complexity? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for spending the afternoon with me. Thanks, everyone, for coming again. If you didn't sign in, please do sign in. Next month, we'll be hearing about uh, the Freshly Project, retrospective, and